one of the things I've discovered is I, if I record videos on this, then when I upload it to YouTube, YouTube says, oh, that's a copyright infringement. You're not allowed to do that. It'd be good not to do that. Sort of thing. Um, what do vampires have to do with bats? They're totally fictitious, right? Well, there are vampires, yes, but. Yes, yes, there are real vampires, vampire bats, but not the kind that are quasi-human that live forever and can be chased away with uh, various trinkets of, of different sorts, a crucifix usually, garlic for some reason, pretty interesting. But for some reason, whenever I, I think about this topic of, of what is it like to be a bat, I also think about how uh, especially the Europeans are fixated on that the fiction of the vampire and, and the odd connection it has with love. And that's pretty weird too, uh, how that, that, especially the biting part, you know, what's, what's with that? In any case, Today we're looking at uh, um, Thomas Nagel's article, What's It Like to Be a Bat? And obviously he's not that interested in trying to figure out what it's like to be a bat. In fact, I think what inspired uh, his, his interest was a, a topic that was posed uh, for, for people to send in essays, and this was his essay about what it was like to be a bat. So I'm looking at it, it starts on page 300, if you have your text. And he argues, well, if you're going to worry about this, this problem, then basically you're, you're suggesting that there is something it is like to be that organism. There's something it is like to be that organism. Um, but then he goes on, and, and this is the beginning of his actual article instead of the little intro there by Bar Baron Baronet, 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 however you say Stan's name. Um, and he starts off by talking about consciousness and says that without consciousness, the mind body problem would be much less interesting with consciousness. It seems hopeless. So what is the mind-body problem? Well, the mind-body problem is actually, of course, ancient uh, and has to do with the idea that we have a soul, that the main part of us is a soul, but nonetheless that we have a body. And what's the connection between the soul and the body? Uh, it blossoms as a problem with the modern period when Rene Descartes uh, argues uh, that the only kind of knowledge you can have for certain begins with my knowing that I exist. And so we get the famous line, cogito ergo sum. You've all heard that one before? Cogito ergo sum, which is Latin for I think, therefore I am. There's tons of jokes that start off with that, right? Uh, but for Descartes, his, his problem was uh, that at the time uh, he lived, his teachers were all very argumentative with one another over uh, a dichotomy between the Aristotelian point of view, which had uh, been in vogue uh, for a couple hundred years by then, uh, after it had come back after the Crusades, and the Platonic view, which was essentially the, still the main uh, dogma of the church, and Descartes was Roman Catholic. Uh, and so you had monks, his teachers, Jesuits primarily, uh, that uh, all uh, found themselves arguing over whether or not uh, the soul uh, was totally immaterial and the body physical, and that there was some kind of connection between it. And Aristotle's point that the only thing that can exist are things that have substance. And if they have to have substance, then the soul cannot be invisible 
can't be abstract uh, the way Plato describes it, instead has to be part of the body, has to be physical. Uh, and Aristotle argued that what the soul was was the activity of the body, which was kind of difficult to grasp. You know, somehow that uh, you know, the way the body moves and does things, that's the soul. But of course, for Aristotle, if the body dies, that's the end of the soul as well. Unless you want to say, well, but then the soul is really uh, uh, the behavior of a dead body, which wouldn't be very active. Right? Um, so there's a, a conflict there, and I'm sure you can tell with the, uh, the church that, that was a big problem because as far as they were concerned, the soul was the main thing that you were trying to save. Uh, and the idea uh, that you were trying to make life happy was absolutely anathema to what they were trying to, to do because uh, you were you were convinced they were convinced that the and this is a platonic idea uh, that attachment to the physical is corruption the physical rots basically whereas the ideas are perfect unchanging uh, ideal right the idea is ideal right uh, so the idea of a perfect triangle is unchanging right you might have individual triangles and they might be broken and made and so on, but the ideal of the perfect triangle is totally unchanging throughout all time. It's not dependent on us. It's a fact, essentially, right? Uh, and in that sense, uh, you know, the soul, which was connected to the ideas for Plato, had to also be abstract, invisible, and therefore eternal, because of course, uh, to kill something, what you're doing is breaking its pieces apart. But if the soul has no parts, uh, you cannot break it. Uh, of course, you can also not construct it. So there is an issue there. Uh, uh, Plato's concept of the soul seems to be uh, very similar to uh, the idea of the uh, reincarnation idea that we get from Asia, right? The, the Buddhist uh, idea uh, that the soul is eternal uh, and goes into one body, and then when that body dies, it moves into another body, etc. Right? You're familiar with that. The metaphor of the the candles: as the one candle goes out, the the, fly, the fire lights the next candle in line. So the soul passes on uh, to another body. Right? Uh, it seems very similar to what Plato must have been thinking: that souls are eternal. They're neither constructed nor destroyed because they have no parts. Well, Descartes, of course, could not stand uh, this uh, indeterminacy uh, between the two sides of his teachers and determined uh, to fix that by deciding what was absolutely certain. And so he went into his famous uh, dialogue uh, with himself, uh, trying to decide uh, um, what things he could doubt. And he came to what's called the universal doubt, doubted everything, and eventually got to the point where he thought not, not only could he not trust his senses because they lie to him, they give you different impressions of wax depending on the temperature, on the light, you know, you change the light, you change the colors, you move, you see things differently, etc. Uh, so you can't trust your senses. He wasn't even sure that he existed. He thought, perhaps there's this demon uh, that is all-powerful that prevents me from knowing that I don't really exist, and that I'm just imagining that I exist when I really don't. Uh, by the way, are you familiar with The Matrix? Everybody seen the movie The Matrix? That's a perfect example of this Descartes problem uh, of the, the demon that, that completely uh, misleads you because you're really s sitting in a vat of jello somewhere uh, and your mind is completely under the control of this computer. In a sense, that's a perfect example of a contemporary example of uh, Descartes' uh, worry about this, this demon uh, controlling your mind. But Descartes has a solution to this. He says there's no way that I can actually be in complete doubt about whether or not I exist. Because if I do not exist, then I can't be doubting. 
something. So if I am doubting something, then I must exist. And so that's something that Descartes feels he's absolutely certain about. So he concludes, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am. But the, the sum that he's talking about is this abstract concept of soul, the mind, for Descartes. And so this leads to a modern uh, uh, version of the mind-body problem. He believes that he has a mind, but it's abstract and separate from the body. And then the question, of course, becomes how do the two of them uh, interact, etc. And so the, that's the mind-body problem, where it gets started. And of course, there's been lots of answers, uh, some saying that there's no such invisible soul, uh, there's others that argue that, uh, um, in fact, just the opposite, there's no real body. Uh, in fact, that's the contemporary point of view, uh, that uh, what we think of as a physical body is actually energy in an arrangement. Uh, and in that sense, energy is the same stuff of soul, uh, so that soul is actually energy. And so there's, there's actually no conflict because everything is soul, essentially. Uh, and so, of course, the soul can interact with the body since the body is essentially soul material as well. So that's, that's kind of the contemporary point of view uh, today because uh, we think of all our particles as quarks and quarks are going in and out of existence. They're energy in an arrangement, right? Uh, so, so if you think of it, the, you know, in a modern sense, the problem has been solved that direction. Uh, but for the most part, people were trying to uh, explain soul as physical in the sense that our physical brain somehow creates consciousness. And so, of course, that's the big problem there. And that's the problem uh, that uh, Thomas Nagel is concerned about at this point, right? So if we have consciousness, and it's based on a physical body. How is that possible? How does consciousness come from a physical body? There seems to be kind of a, a, a problem when you leap from one level of existence to another, that to go to the level where a being becomes conscious. So you have a rock, no consciousness <coughs> as far as we know. Uh, you have a lizard, now you have motion, you clearly have uh, the lizard making decisions, uh, it can have pain and so on and so forth. Um, uh, last night my St. Bernard was very concerned, I had a mouse get stuck on one of those sticky traps, you're familiar, you know, those little sticky traps. My wife thinks it's terrible when we catch mice on those because of course then they're suffering. I think of it as bait, right? Because once you get one on the trap and it squirms and squeaks and everything else, uh, eventually some other mice come over to see what's wrong with it. And then you catch two or three, which is that way to, so it's bait for me. Um, but my St. Bernard puppy, well, she's actually a year old now. Is that still a puppy for a St. Bernard? Yes, yeah, she looks like a puppy uh, and she acts like one too. In any case, uh, she just sat there staring at this poor mouse, squirming, and, and every once in a while she would move over and like get her paw stuck on the trap, and, and that was not much fun. But in any case, it's pretty clear that my dog, now notice, that's really the same question as a bat. How do we know what it's like to be a bat? How do I know what it's like to be a dog? And yet I'm convinced that I know a lot about what my dog is thinking even though, and, and we speak to one another, of course. My dog says things like, Grrr, you know, and, and I, I say things like, Grrr, you know, you know, you know. So, so we speak dog, right? You know, and to some extent, I also, you know, I speak English with the dog. Uh, you know, I also speak French with the dog, why not? You know, I refer to her as la pouche de resistance. I also think of her as the face that launched a thousand shits. <laughs> so that's like Helen, right, of Troy. A little different, a little different. Ships instead of shits. Um, so there's 
have lots of fun with that. But you, you've had pets, yes, I'm guessing, for most of you. And they're not things that you ate afterwards, right? These are, these are creatures that you've, you love, essentially, right? I suppose, even if it's a guinea pig, you know, maybe that's harder to love. I don't know, guinea pigs. But dogs, at least, they really become an important part of our, um, our lives. We think of them as family, right? Uh, and you can communicate with them. But do you really understand what they're thinking? As, as Dinelli, my, my St. Bernard, was looking at that mouse, do, we, do I really understand what she's thinking while she's watching that poor mouse? And what about the mouse? Who understands the, the, the situation the mouse is in? That's kind of the, the issue here. And by the way, it gets even uh, more pertinent to our everyday conversation when you think, well, wait a minute. How do I know what you're thinking? Right? How do, I mean, your life has been very different than mine. Maybe we have a very similar biochemistry uh, in the same way that bats are mammals, we are mammals. Um, but we're much closer genetically, of course, than, than bats, I, I presume. I don't know, it might be like 95% compared to 99%, whatever, right? That kind of an issue. So this problem gets worse, if you think about it. It's not just about a bat. So conscious experience is a widespread phenomenon. It's not just human beings. Uh, Descartes, by the way, apparently thought that uh, the mind was something only humans have. By the way, I should, should also bring this up, and that is that we think of the modern period as the beginning of what we think of as the modern self, or the modern person. Right? Um, what is that? Well, if you think of it this way, Modern, modern metaphor, right? Uh, that we're all like computers, and in order to have any programs loaded on our heads, have I already mentioned this as a metaphor? Um, but if you think of us as, as computers, we need an operating system, right? So basically I think of the operating system as the language you speak, right? And then based on the language you speak, we upload programs like conversations uh, through your, your peers. You know, they, they upload things like eating breakfast, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, being nice to your sister, you know, you, you name it. These are all, in a sense, little programs that your parents upload. And to tie this in with the question from last class about the in, interpreting the art, so the, the pile of art on the lawn uh, outside, does, does your ability to interpret art depend on your belief in a meaning of life? And what I'm tying that into is a, uh, a meta-narrative, a story. And for example, and some of you brought this up in your response to the quiz question. If you go look at my class notes and other items. One of the things I have is the question, what is religion? And I take a very uh, sociological point of view uh, with regard to what a religion is um, and argue that basically a religion is a person's belief in a meta-narrative, or a story that explains the world for them. Right? So you're believing in a story. Now it could be a traditional story, such as the Roman Catholic, Protestant, Buddhist, Confucian. Uh, those are all essentially stories that explain, remember those three main questions that any society has to answer for you. Who are you? What is your place in society? And how do you maintain that place? So if you think of the meta-narrative, you believe, as the story that explains who you are, what your place is in the world, and how you maintain that. What, what behaviors, what acts 
what your role is. You, you think of it this way, it's, it's perfectly uh, like uh, your, at your role in a play, right? So if, if you're, uh, pardon? I thought I heard someone ask. But so if you're, if you're given a role, you know, to play Juliet uh, in Romeo and Juliet, for example, uh, and you wake up in the tomb and there's Romeo dead on the floor, and instead of following your lines, you go over and you, you kick him and you walk out. You know, you know you're, no, 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 no. The, the director's going to be all upset with you. You totally destroy the play. You're supposed to instead, oh, what's this? Poison, I see, hath been his timely, untimely end. And, you know, cha, drunk all and left no friendly drop to help me after. Oh, happy dagger, here is thy sheath. There, rust it. Yes, etc. Right. That's what you're supposed to do. Well, if you totally screw that up, you're out. You're not going to be able to perform as Juliet because you're not following your role, right? Uh, so, if you think of it this way, you know, as Shakespeare says, all of all the world's a stage, and all of us are merely players. You know, each with our entrances and our exits, and so on, right? You know, so so we're all playing roles, and those roles are basically in a particular story. And of course, the story is up to us to believe. Remember, as, as heretics, being Americans, we're, we're told that we are free to choose what we believe in, right? You know, that's, that's your, your, no, it's mandatory. It's not like you just have the choice to believe what you want. You have to choose. Remember when I joined the army and they, they asked me what, Religion was I, and I had like five or six choices. You know, one of them was other, uh, but still, you, you, know, you know, you have to pick. And the main concern they have is they want to make sure they put the right letter on your dog tag so that if you get shot and you're dying, they know which chaplain to get uh, for you, right? You know, so that's important, because right? you, know, you don't want the wrong chaplain, you know, like the guy that, you know, I guess there's a clinic in town where you can get uh, surgery on your eyes. They have laser optical surgery for you know, cataracts and things. And from what I understand, uh, the doctor always likes to ask, ask the patient before starting if he would like him to say a short prayer. And the one client said, well, is he Catholic? And they said, no, he's Seventh-day Adventist. And he says, oh, well, I don't want him saying a prayer, because that, that, that should be funny, I think, but maybe not. Okay. So you're believing in a story. As Americans, we have to believe in a story, even if what we believe is no story is true. A lot of people, I think, actually pick that story. It's the story they believe in, uh, and they think, therefore, they're not religious, because they don't believe in any of those stories. Well. Strictly speaking, if that's the story you believe in, that's your religion. So I'm, I'm very frustrating for people because I don't believe you can not have a religion. It's just that we've got to figure out, well, what is your highest value? Because that's, in a sense, how I would figure out what your, your main meta-narrative that you believe is. Right? If, if the main uh, belief you have is not being made a fool by somebody else, so you're not going to believe anybody, okay, well, that's still a, a belief, right? Uh, and you clearly are setting your highest values. You don't want to be the dupe, right, in any, any such situation, right? Um, mine, by the way, is believing that our, our, at least my main goal in life is learning as much as I can and passing that on to others and getting paid for it, which is pretty cool. You know? Sorry. Actually, my wife gets all the money. You know that. Right? Okay, so, so belief in a meta-narrative. By the way, that doesn't require a God, but you might say that God, by definition, must exist, because God is that in which nothing greater can be thought, so therefore God must exist. But if you think of it as your highest value, that works as well, right? So uh, Paul Tillich is famous for arguing that the concept of God 
is God is our ultimate concern. Our ultimate concern. He was American, well, he was uh, German, but he was a American theologian and Protestant. <clears throat> okay. So when I ask about your meaning of life affecting your interpretation of the art, in a sense, of course it does. Uh, because that's the big picture that you use to do anything, essentially. By the way, of course, it can change throughout your life, probably does. So you, you, you evolve what you think is true, right? Um, education is certainly going to play an important role in that, right? And does that change your political beliefs? Does that change uh, how you feel you should interact with other people, with animals, with trees, with rocks? Sure, all of that. All of that. Okay. Next thing I saw in here uh, that I thought might be interesting um, in uh, trying to uh, understand someone else and understand uh, uh, if they're conscious in the same way that we are, uh, we have what's famously called the Chinese room experiment, uh, the Chinese uh, room test or the, uh, the Turing test. Right? Are you familiar with that and are any of those names, the Turing test, Chinese room experiment? Uh, this is the, ch the Chinese room experiment is where you sit down and you can't see the person that you're talking to. They're on the other side of a wall or a pane of glass or something and you can't see the other side and you ask them questions you're able to have a conversation with them and the goal is for you to determine whether you're talking to a conscious individual or if it's a AI a computer right so if, so, so Alan Turing was uh, convinced uh, that if you eventually could have a computer that could fool you into thinking that it's a conscious person uh, that you, you essentially wouldn't be able to determine the difference between a computer and a person. And if you're familiar with uh, this movie, oh, seen this movie. 
So Ex Machina, pretty, pretty interesting movie. Of course, the thesis is, can a robot fool us into uh, thinking it's conscious? And in that context, the argument that because it fights to survive, that's the proof uh, that it is. Um, do you remember uh, Robin Williams in a Anybody remember what the name of the movie was uh, that Robin Williams was in where he was a robot that gradually got upgrades until eventually he became human? Anybody remember that movie? It was quite a few years ago. Centennial. Centennial Man? Centennial Man, yes. That was also interesting. Uh, same kind of thing. That Wow, in that case, he's not completely human unless he can die. So that's kind of interesting. If you remember 2000 or the Space Odyssey, the interesting problem for Hal, the computer, was that it could feel it. it. It didn't want to be turned off. Remember? Yes? Anybody remember that? Does it annoy you that I keep pulling up videos? or? That's the computer saying, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Fun. So we play with that a lot. Can we uh, turn computers into conscious beings? What would it take uh, in order to do that? Um, we're getting close. A lot of folks are saying we're getting close. Of course, a lot of other folks say it'll never happen. So that's interesting. Um, if it happens, it might happen during your lifetime. That's kind of interesting. Um, and by the way, the big scare is, will they like us? Because they're going to be smarter than us. They already are in some ways, right? And if that's the case, and they basically start to take over things, are they going to be concerned with the carbon units that infest enterprise? You know, the humans, in other words, right? Are they going to think about us and protect us? Um, and problems we have in pro will be programming them. If you think, well, we should just program them so that they don't hurt us. You might remember the laws of robotics that Isaac Asimov coined in iRobot, right? You know, they never hurt a human, et cetera. Um, well, if you, th you actually put that into practice, what you discover is that it's incredibly difficult uh, and not only is it difficult to program a, a, a robot so that it doesn't uh, uh, fall uh, when it's trying to walk over rocky terrain, 
uh, but it's also very difficult to program a robot to be ethical, especially when the real problem is we don't know what that would mean ourselves. So we can't program our own self to be ethical without arguing over things. <coughs> so, next interesting problem in his article. He refers to the poor soi and the en soi on page 301. It says, let me first try to state the issue <coughs> somewhat more fully than by referring to the relation between the subject and the objective, subjective and objective, or between the poor soi for itself and the en soi in itself. Right. Uh, so what's the reference here? This uh, goes to Hegel uh, and Sartre. Uh, uh, Sartre would be the one that would use French for it, but for Hegel, the German that I believe first started using it this way, uh, he refers to the on sich, the for itself, and or, I mean the on sich, the in itself, and the for sich, the for itself. And what does that mean? Well, the in itself is the ego, the self that's having the experience, whatever experience you're experiencing, right? That's you, right? But when you're thinking about who you are, you're thinking about yourself in conceptual terms, so for example, I am Bill Jamison, 206-428-256, maybe I shouldn't say that, I don't know. Uh, you know, ugly, retired, married, four children, you know, dog, you know, you name it, all those conceptual things that I think of, that's me, right? That's how I, I think of myself. But notice that none of that conceptual stuff is actually me, it's instead the program, in a sense, that I'm running in my head that I'm saying is me, right? And so that's my for itself. That's what I think of as me. Sartre, by the way, in his major work, Being and Nothingness, being lettre et le néant, nothingness, right, uh, argues that there's a gap between the en soi and the pour soi. Uh, and what is that gap? Well, you know, what's the gap between my subject of self that I think of as me, I, not the thinking of as me, but that conceptually I think I must have a self, the res cogitans that Descartes talks about, that is having experience, right? I can't actually see that self because everything I see is experience, phenomena, right? And so I'm experiencing all this phenomena and I conceptualize myself, which is also phenomena that I'm thinking of, right? And the thing is that the self that I am and the self that I think of as myself are different. There's a gap between them. The one is my subjective side and the other is the objective side, if you want to call it that, right? You know, the, the way I think of myself. And the problem Sartre points out is that I'm never exactly what I think of myself. You know, if I, by the way, I want to be the best teacher you've ever had, and I know in order to do that, I need to study up on how to be a great teacher, what kinds of things to do, to never stand up on the podium and pee. You know, you know there are certain things, you know, you have to learn in order to, to be a good teacher, you know. Be emotive, you know, you know, supercalifragilistic, expialidocial, you know, all that stuff. Uh, but guess what? I know by looking at some of your faces that I'm not even close to the best teacher you've ever experienced. Ah! Oh. So even though I have this hope to be this perfect role, I'm never it. I mean, there's always a gap between the self that I actually am, and the self that I aspire to, right? There's always this gap. And by the way, for Sartre, that is the nothingness. That's where nothingness enters into the world because of that gap. Uh, and the interesting thing uh, for Sartre is that that gap is what enables us to say non, to say no, 
You know, that, that little kid at two years old that starts to say no and annoys the heck out of mom, uh, you know, and, and so on, right? You know, human beings can say no. Now, that's not just human beings. When I ask my dog to come in, it looks at me and goes, Whoa. you know, it doesn't want to come in, you know. You know, come with me instead of rolling in the snow, you know. It clearly says no, right? So I'm sure that animals like dogs can say no too, right? You know, that might uh, be enough to say, of course, they're conscious, right? Uh, it gets a little bit more problematic when we ask, are they sub, are, are they uh, uh, self-conscious? Uh, because for Hegel, uh, the whole point of the Ansi and the Fursi uh, as a dialectical process is for me to realize that I'm a conceptual schema that I'm thinking about. And realizing that that's me, although it's not quite, that I'm constantly going back and forth with myself. So for example, I might uh, see a candy bar, a Snickers bar, right? And if I look at that Snickers bar, I think, wow, I want the Snickers bar. But then the little blue angel in my head says, no, you're not supposed to eat that. It's fattening. It's not good for you. It doesn't do any, et, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and then, of course, the red angel turns around and bops that blue angel right in the, in the face uh, because, well, I like those snicker bars, right? You know, so, so I have this fight inside of me, right? It's inside my own head, right? And yet, here it is, you know, a knockdown fight between the red angel and the blue angel, right? You know, trying to decide whether or not I ought to eat the candy bar or not, right? And that's, that's of course, the typical, uh, with any kind of conflict you find yourself negotiating over. Uh, but one of those two sides will win, right? It's not like Pelosi and Trump, right? One of those, one of those two will have to decide, I'll either eat the candy bar or not, right? Uh, and in that case, Hegel argues that the one then becomes the slave and the other the master, right? So it's the master-slave relationship. By the way, it keeps going back and forth. And if you're totally dependent on the slave, eventually that's, the slave becomes the master, right? So that's considered beautiful literature in his book, uh, The Phenomenology of Mind or Spirit. Uh, there's two different translations, right? Um, but so that dialectical process for Hegel is an evolving process and it keeps on going. So from one moment to the next, I'm going to enter into another dialogue with myself. And what makes me me is the dialogue itself. So don't be misled into thinking I'm just the one side, the in itself, or the other, the for itself. I'm the combination of the two of them in a constant dialectical process, right? Uh, so the self is all of this. It's a process, right? Very close to what we would say today uh, if you think in terms of Douglas Hofstadter's book, uh, I Am a Strange Loop. It's basically this kind of computer-like loop that's going on where I'm monitoring myself, I make a decision, then I'm monitoring myself, I'm making another decision, I'm going to keep doing that. That's in a, in a sense uh, what a, a person is, right? And uh, part of the modern self that starts with Descartes, or we might, by the way, we might argue that it starts even sooner, um, uh, a, a author named See that? Harold Bloom, Shakespeare, the invention of the human, argues that this modern concept of the self begins with Shakespeare, and very specifically in the play Hamlet. And I bet you all know the scene where that occurs, where Hamlet's standing there and saying, <laughs> 
to be or not to be. Harold Bloom argues that that's the first time that an individual in a play demonstrates thinking to himself. I don't know, maybe you, you can think of something earlier, although Harold Bloom has quite a lot of experience, um, if you know who he is. Um, I, and I, I often think about uh, St. Augustine, who basically is arguing with himself a lot, although instead of himself, he's referring to the person he's arguing with as God. Uh, so that's questionable, right? But for Shakespeare, beginning with Hamlet and then multiple uh, characters following that uh, in, in sequence, right? It's, you know, so before that doesn't happen, but with Hamlet, we get this, this reflection, this self-reflection, uh, which a lot of folks will now argue is the beginning of the program that we can be trained to think about ourselves the way Hamlet does, right? You know, is, is, is that a program that had to be introduced to us, kind of developing the way it did? Uh, or uh, do all human beings all over the world, once they reach a certain age, perhaps think of themselves this way? Actually, I think a lot of the evidence seems to indicate that it's relatively unique to the Western experience. And by the way, you notice that, that becoming that kind of modern self is an absolute requirement for social contract philosophy, uh, the idea that we are uh, citizens and have rights. It's, it requires you to be a modern self, to think of yourself as a self that has rights. So before you can have a society that begins to have democratic principles and democratic forms of government, you really have to have this modern self program running in enough individuals that they can participate in democratic caucuses and things of that sort, right? Uh, and so if we're trying to create democracies in the rest of the world where, for example, they don't have maybe the right operating system, the right language in order to think this way, uh, can't load that program, so to speak, in their head, they're just absolutely confused. Well, we suggest that they're a democracy now and they ought to vote and that things like women, for example, have rights. They have no clue, I think, uh, what we're talking about, let alone being able to put that into practice. Uh, so, and it's the kind of thing that has to evolve. And by the way, it's also the kind of thing that a society could lose because it has to be trained. Individuals have to learn how to think of themselves as a self, as a modern self, with rights, et cetera, right? And by the way, it's a problematic thing because once you do train young people to think this way about themselves, they can become very despondent, very depressed, because if you teach them that they are a self and they have to think for themselves and be critical thinkers, but then you don't give them any hope. Whoa, now you're depressed, right? You know, the world's going to hell, you know, probably overheat, you know, uh, we'll have plagues, we'll run out of food, we'll run out of whatever, and you know, we're all terrible because we're killing mice on little sticky traps, etc. So that's, that's all fun, that's all interconnected. And when you think in terms of this question, the poor soi, the on soi, is it depressing or is it absolutely thrilling? By the way, we might also point out that I don't know who we are. I'm, it's the, the royal we, I guess. Um, um, by the way, uh, Descartes would have read Shakespeare. So he would have been familiar with that play. So if you want to still argue that Descartes is the one that develops the modern self versus Shakespeare, uh, you, you can see that connection, right? Shakespeare's first, right? Um, but, into the pool. So there's a book by Carl Sagan's son, Dorian Sagan, if you're familiar with them. Remember Carl Sagan? Uh, 
had uh, the movie Contact and all sorts of things. His son uh, and uh, Eric Schneider wrote Into the Cool. And this is about the uh, law of thermodynamics that everything cools down. So the universe is going into the cool. And what that means practically is that everything that's organized eventually falls apart. Because as things cool down, they basically stop running properly, right? Uh, and as the universe then uh, theoretically will cool down, everything that's co coherent and organized will gradually fall apart. What fights against this, apparently, is life. And life tends to get more complex. Ten life tends to fight against this thermodynamic uh, uh, problem uh, and somehow pass on information to another generation that gets more complex and develops and fights uh, so that more life blossoms and that life, in fact, gets more and more complex so that we develop things. Freedom has evolved so to speak, as Daniel Dennett uh, argues in his book of that title, right? Uh, so, so consciousness evolves from this. Life evolves from whatever, maybe primordial slime or whatever, uh, but eventually that life will develop the complexity uh, that it will also have consciousness, and then it gets to the point where it has self-consciousness. And since we're part of the world, by the way, that also means that the world is self-conscious uh, because we are, right? Uh, so that's pretty cool if you're interested in that. If you're interested in that as your, your uh, paper, by the way, you're welcome to. I don't think I have it listed as, as one of the philosophers, but it certainly would uh, be an excellent choice, right? Um, okay. In talking about bats, he talks about how odd they are as a life form. Uh, I remember myself when I was in college, I worked as a guard in a retirement home, a friend's boarding home of Concord Meeting in Westchester. I was just a couple blocks down from the university, from the, the off campus house where I lived, and that was great. I made $1.65 an hour. And I got to work there about 54 hours a week, which was great because it paid all my college. I actually took out a loan, a college loan, when I first got started because I thought you were supposed to. Uh, so I took out a loan of $1,000, put it in the bank, ended up having enough money to pay all my tuition and my room and board. It was $180 a semester because there were 18 weeks, and so it was $10 a week for my room and $10 a week for my board, so $180 for food, $180 for my room, and my tuition was roughly around 500 something. So basically I ended up having enough money to pay for all of it, and then when I graduated and my student loan became due, I took the money out of the bank and paid it off and I kept all the interest. So that was kind of cool. Hmm. But when I was in the retirement home, during the summer, they would have the windows open and bats would get in. I, I don't mean the people that live there, I mean, you know, the flying kind. And so part of our uniform at night when we were patrolling the, the place was to carry a tennis racket. And so we'd be walking down the hallways and every once in a while we'd see a bat. It was flying down the hallway and you just gradually, you know, take out the tennis racket and swing it. Boom. It was like playing badminton. Of course, that, that wiped out the poor little bat. They would fold their wings and fly like a birdie and, you know, just land. We'd pick them up and throw them out. So I had experience with bats. That was, that was fun. Um, I didn't feel any any guilt or anything. They weren't supposed to be in the building. So. And every once in a while, one of the, the, usually a lady, 
would, would call on the, the desk where I was sitting with, the, with their phone and, and say, there was a bat in my room. And then I'd go up and sure enough, somewhere in the room there's a bat and of course I had to, had to get it out. Well, you know, they were scared to death. Um, notice the vampire concept. I'm not sure why uh, we think of the bats and associate them with the fictional uh, vampire thing. I hope you got a kick out of some of the musicals that I paid, I played. But the problem is not confined, page 302, the problem is not confined to exotic cases, however, for it exists between one person and another. Any of you been married? Yes. You get the idea. And they also say men are from Mars and women are from where? Where are women from? Nobody knows. Venus. I suppose. That's you know, that's very sexual actually. If you think of if you think of what Venus looks like, here's a picture of Venus being born. Very famous painting, right? Everyone's familiar with that picture? And in Greek, Venus's name is Aphrodite, right? Aphros. Aphros means sperm, basically, or foam. So sea foam is Aphros. Um, and if you remember in the story, uh, the mother gave a sickle to the one god to kill his father, because the father was eating all of his children. And so uh, um, as the father stepped over him, he reached up and sliced off his testicles and threw them into the ocean and the sperm that came out of the testicles is what gave birth to Venus. Interesting story, I suppose. Very strange. But Mars, of course, is the god of war, uh, so of course the association is men are very warlike and women are very beautiful, I suppose. Bottom of page 303, there's the uh, word phenomenological. I've used it before. Uh, phenomena, uh, phane is the Greek word for a lantern. And logical, of course, is the study of. So this is phenomenological is the study of phenomena, of what appears to us. Um, and the interesting aspect of that is, is recognizing that Anything that appears to us does so because of the lantern that we ourselves bring to see that experience. And the lantern in that sense is our senses, our eyes, our ears, etc. So, so you see because of your eyes, you hear because of your ears, obviously. So all the phenomena that's out there is perceived by us. But the main concern is that's a recognition that what we're perceiving is only because of the kind of senses we have, which means we're not seeing things the way they are, we're seeing things the way it seems to us, right? You know, so, so I don't think giraffes talk, but it turns out that they do, I just couldn't hear it, right? You know, that kind of thing. I don't see all the colors. If you ever had parakeets, they're full of colors that we don't see because we don't see in what is it, the ultraviolet or infrared, one or the other, I forget. But they see one another, uh, and that apparently even communicates emotion between them and so on, uh, more identify, right? So the, the feathers have colors that we don't see, et cetera. We don't see the very small things, although we've invented tools like microscopes. We don't see the very big things, but we've invented tools like macroscopes, no, no telescopes. Very important point, I almost missed it, page 303, right in the middle of the right, right side there, uh, he says, 
um, we come to the conclusion that there are facts that do not consist in the truth of propositions. So when, when we think of a, a fact, a fact that we know, we think of it as a statement that we know to be true. And we think, well, and then I know it, right? Uh, so that's a fact for us. But the thing is, uh, there have to be facts that exist outside of human knowledge. Now, there are folks that would argue that, of course, because it seems pointless. Uh, unless we can know it, what's the point of arguing that there's facts out there that we can't know? Well, that's kind of interesting. Paradoxical. But normally, it would seem that facts embody a particular point of view. A few have a particular interpretation of the artwork outside. We wouldn't call that a fact. Uh, that's your interpretation. And someone else might have another interpretation, and those interpretations might be completely different. When we were talking about the artwork in the lobby. Uh, some folks thought of it as a guillotine. Other people thought of it as a vagina. Other people thought of it as a hole uh, that represented a gap in being or something. Uh, lots of different interpretations. None of those are wrong. In fact, none of those are essentially right in a way. You, know, you could say, okay, the artist said that it was this. Well, okay. But that doesn't mean that all the other ones are wrong because all of our interpretations are interesting. Right? And by the way, there's a dialogue where Plato uh, has Socrates talking with an artist, uh, trying to find out what his interpretation of his own play was, and coming to conclude that his interpretation of his own play was crap. You know, uh, basically, he didn't, he didn't understand his own piece any better than the rest of us, right? You know, so, so it's not really the artist that, that determines the meaning of something, it's the audience. That determines it. It's a problem, by the way, in court when you you say something and the jury all listens to you and they all conclude that you meant such and such. And you say that's not what I meant. Sorry, you're wrong. You're outvoted. What you really meant is what the audience concludes you meant, not what you would have liked them to have thought that you meant. Right? You lose. That's 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 the way that kind of feedback works, right? Um, okay. uh, the, the point that all matter is really energy, he mentions that on page 306. Uh, um, and I thought it was kind of strange because I, I, I've often, in saying that to people, find them puzzled. Um, he says here, for example, people are now told at an early age that all matter is really energy. That surprised me, because I don't know that everybody at an early age is told that. Right. Did you have any questions of, uh, of what his article was about, or anything puzzle you at all? Did you look at his, uh, his video that I have here? Uh, I picked this because I... I always like the idea that uh, you get a chance to see the individual. If I, if I have a, a live individual, that is. Or some of the ones we'll be referring to are dead. Some of them are mostly dead. But most of them are completely dead, I guess. The ancient and completely dead. So if it would be wrong to do so, it would have to be so if you listen to this, I thought one of the most interesting parts of this uh, is, is similar to several of his other projects. Uh, his newest book, by the way, is Mind and Cosmos. And very similar to the, the question that comes up uh, in what is it like to be a bat and what is consciousness, he points out that a reductivist view of where consciousness comes from, and that is uh, thinking that it comes from the brain, right, as opposed to something else that exists kind of supervening on the brain, right, so that there's another level of existence in a sense, and that is kind of that Cartesian concept of the, 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 
the thinking thing, right? That that is not really a physical activity. It's somewhat above that, right? Uh, it's, it rides, it supervenes. It's, it's kind of rides on top of it, right? So in some sense, it's certainly dependent on the brain. If you stab the brain with a knife, end of mind, theoretically. Actually, maybe not, by the way. Because uh, if you think of all of existence as eternal, as some physicists do, uh, thanks to Einstein's time-space cone. This is Einstein's time-space light cone. Uh, you are at the X, which makes you the center of the universe. Right? And your future is in one direction. So in this case, the diagram shows time going up. And the past is in the back, down below, rather. Um, but all of the space cone exists at once according to contemporary physicists like Brian Greene uh, and some others uh, in his book, The Fabric of the Cosmos. Um, and so all of time is kind of like a DVD, if you think of it. Uh, he uses, in The Fabric of the Cosmos, Brian Greene uh, uses the DVD of, uh, which, which one? Uh, Gone with the Wind. Uh, so, so remember Tara? You know, the, you know the, that, that one, Gone with the Wind. Uh, and if you think of it, well, the DVD is permanent in a sense, right? All the pits and everything on it uh, are not moving. What makes the movie play is you're putting it into a DVD player uh, where uh, it's like our consciousness, right? It brings the pits out of the time-space cone, so to speak, uh, so that it looks like movement is happening. Right? So, so from this point of view, the universe looks like it's, it's moving through time and that things are evolving uh, because our consciousness is moving through the DVD bits, right? like a, a DVD player. And so we're playing it, which by the way means that each of us might be seeing the universe at a different time. We don't know that we're all seeing it concurrently. We might each have a different a cone. Although if you, you put them together, you can have multiple cones going together on kind of a trajectory, uh, etc. Uh, so that depending on how proximate we are, our spa time space cone should be pretty similar. Right? Um, but in this case, what's interesting to me is that all of time and space exists at once. If that's the case, evolution is a trick. Because uh, actually everything you know, the dinosaurs are, in a sense, still there in time and space, right? You know, uh, uh, the, the things that you're going to be doing tomorrow are actually already there, so your illusion of free will is just that, because everything is going to happen precisely the way it's always essentially going to have happened, right? Uh, so that's all interesting. I haven't asked a quiz question yet. Why do you think we use the concept of the vampire, the fictitious concept of the vampire associated with love? Why do we put the two of them together? So why do we put them together with love? Pardon? Vampires, yes. The, the three videos that I was showing as people were coming in, uh, were, the, the one video was the American song, Bright Eyes. And I believe that song is what started that trend. Uh, but uh, when they used that song in Europe, they transformed it into a complete musical. Uh, and you know, it was basically the musical 
version of the young woman that's so attracted to the vampire that she willingly sacrifices herself for love to the vampire. It just actually seems really weird. Because vampires are usually depicted as pretty ugly things. So that's kind of, remember there's also the, the version where the, the young man who loves her uh, goes with a odd professor to try to rescue her uh, and ends up killing the vampire, et cetera. You know, so. But love is always somehow associated with this vampire story. Is that a good question? No, nobody likes that question. Any questions for me? You've been thinking about who you're going to pick for your term paper. I keep mentioning different individuals in the hopes that you might find someone interesting.